Our journey towards a sustainable solution to open source sustainability starts a few years back in April 2014, exactly. Who here recognizes this logo? Any takers? Yeah, it is the logo of the Heartblade bug. A bug so bad that it compromised the confidentiality of four and a half million US patient records and cost the industry an estimated $500 million. That bug was a pivotal moment where the tech industry realized that open source was ubiquitous, critical, and highly underfunded. Ubiquitous because the OpenSSL library that had this bug was actually relied upon by two thirds of active websites on the internet. Critical because the OpenSSL library was responsible for encryption, keeping communication private, making bank transac transactions secure, securing medical records, etc and underfunded because OpenSSL only had one full-time maintainer and was operating on a ridiculously small budget of roughly $2,000 per year. Of course, this created like a seismic shock in the industry. And everyone started talking about the problem of open source sustainability, of maintainer burnout, and people starting, started to try to find solutions. The first solutions that emerged were very much focused on preventing another Heartblade bug. The first one uh, was the Core Infrastructure Initiative. That was an industry-wide effort backed by the large tech companies and organized by the Linux Foundation. It had a pretty large fund uh, that was administered by the Linux Foundation itself and a steering committee of, composed of industry experts. And its goal was really to harden the security of key open source projects. But because its focus was essentially on core infrastructure, i.e. to prevent a new heartbleed, it really was not looking at making open source as a whole more sustainable. As a result, a lot of other efforts started existing. A really interesting one um, was open source developers deciding to leverage existing tools such as Patreon. So Patreon um, is originally aimed at artists, musicians, and writers. Um, you know, its, its goal is to create a meaningful revenue stream for artists. Um, and it had, in the person of Evan Yu pictured here, a real success story. Um, Evan was able to quite quickly collect roughly $17,000 per month in order to fund him working full-time on the uh, Vue.js project. However, there, there aren't that many other um, similar examples of a single open source developer being able to essentially get the equivalent of a reasonable full-time tech salary to focus fully on open source outside of working for a company. Let's look at another um, different attempt to create a similar kind of revenue stream for open source developers, Gitcoin. So what exactly is Gitcoin? Well, Gitcoin is actually multiple things, but uh, central to it is a GitHub issue market, where as a developer was the owner of a project, you can essentially add uh, bounties to GitHub issues and developers 
submit their work as a pull request and claim the bounty as such. And the platform actually has been distributing quite a bunch of money, uh, over half a million dollar in 2018 only, right? It's blockchain based, so developers actually receive bounties in Ether. Um, but what's quite interesting about Gitcoin is it's a whole ecosystem. So it also provides a Patreon-like solution uh, called Grants and a small ad network, CodeFund. What is CodeFund? Well, CodeFund leverages the fact that open source projects usually have websites and that those websites are um, great places to find developers interested in a specific set of technology, right? So the ads are very much focused on hiring and they're contextual ads. So, you know, they avoid all of the tracking issues that um, advertisement uh, usually has on the web. From a financial perspective, um, CodeFund has been roughly uh, creating $10,000 of monthly revenue, uh, of which 60%, so six, uh, $6,000 per month, is redistributed to project maintainers. Open source sustainability has even attracted venture capitalists, which with OSS Capital have created a venture fund specializing in open source based companies. Another really interesting project is Open Collective. So Open Collective initially um, was designed for um, essentially communities to self-organize and it has been applied quite effectively to open source. So Open Collective even created an open, um, a 501c6, so a nonprofit um, to collect funds for open source and provide transparency and then redistribute that money to the maintainers of open source projects as they saw fit. So the real big success story of Open Collective is of course Webpack, which has been uh, funded in um, four to five hundred thousand um, dollars per year um, and created like a, a really um, a really win-win situation uh, for key sponsors. There's a really interesting story about how Trivago uh, funded um, um, uh, Webpack through Open Collective um, and essentially, as a result, got um, a ton of interest from um, JavaScript developers who wanted to join the company because they saw it as really um, uh, caring about open source. That said, Open Collective has somewhat of a long tail problem um, because essentially most of the money is going to a few projects that have a lot of visibility and um, the, um, the rest of the projects aren't getting as much money. And so in order to solve that, um, Open Collective created Back Your Stack. The idea behind Back Your Stack is that as the owner of a project or as a company that relies on, on a bunch of open source projects or has a bunch of projects on their GitHub, uh, you can basically just run a code and it will tell you not only your dependencies, but the dependencies of your dependencies recursively. And then allow you to essentially fund the whole dependency tree uh, through Open Collective. This is actually a very similar scheme to what Tidelift, um, another company operating in this space, um, has um, created as a business model. So what is Tidelift exactly? Well, it's essentially um, Red Hat's business model, but for the long tail. So it provides to companies um, a, a number of things around an open source project, including security updates, maintenance, legal assurance, etc., cetera, um, for all of the open source um, projects that an organization relies on. And how does it does it, how does it do it, sorry? Well, that's the really interesting aspect, is it do it by paying the actual maintainers of the projects to do the work to keep those projects up to date and secure. And so contrary to the other projects that we've talked about, there's no real success story yet of a set of developers having built a business on top of Tidelift, uh, but there's certainly like a lot of interest for it. 
So, you know, we've looked at a few solutions around open source sustainability. Um, but I think it's also time to consider taking a different look at those and seeing whether they really address the problem um, in a way that seems like a good fit. And frankly, there are a number of limitations of addressing open source sustainability through just the lens of funding. Right? The first problem is whether or not it actually scales. Like, is the current level of funding that we're providing realistic compared to the ubiquity of open source, to the fact that open source is everywhere. Secondly, we can really wonder whether money is really the problem and what's missing from open source, right? So essentially, are we asking the right problem was this? Thirdly, and I think that's also really key, is it's important to wonder whether solving open source sustainability through funding alone would create the kind of outcomes that we want to see in the industry. Don't we, don't we risk a future where we'd have on one side um, charity funded open source developers and on the other sort of corporate developers writing essentially glue code. Um, and so, you know, being fairly well paid, but having really, really boring jobs. And lastly, I think, and, and that's sort of where I believe is the real answer to open source sustainability long term, is to have a different look at what the real value of open source is and, and to try to address this issue with that perspective in mind. All right, so let's look at scaling first. So this is a $100 bill. If you stack a hundred dollars, uh, sorry, a hundred bills of a hundred dollar, you get ten thousand dollars in this nice little stack here. Um, for reference, that is the monthly revenue that Code Fund uh, that we've just talked about is making from advertisement. Now, if we stack a hundred of those, right? So two orders of magnitude more. Um, we get to $1 million. So this is roughly the amount of money that Open Collective is collecting um, per year, or at least was in 2018 and 2019. I, I don't know what the numbers are for 2019, sorry. But roughly around that. That's also uh, the amount that Tidelift, the other company that we talked about earlier, has committed to pay developers from um, the VC funding that I received. But how much is really $1 million comparing to sort of like the size of open source in the world? And, and a good example of that, a, a good way of, of thinking about that to me is to sort of have a look at the worldwide developer population and see how many developers there are actually as, as a start. And secondly, um, to start thinking about how much money are these developers paid? How, like what's the total mass of salary paid to developers worldwide? So this is data from a developer census that was run in 2018. And it basically says that there are roughly 12 million full-time professional developers uh, a little over 6 million that are working part-time and roughly 4 million that are non-professional, right? So a bit above 20 million uh, developers worldwide. Let's do some, some quick back of the envelope math to see what kind of like salary, um, total salary that creates worldwide. So if we take a 65,000 um, annual salary for developers, uh, for full-time developers, uh, this gives us roughly $780 billion spent worldwide on full-time developers. Add to that roughly 35 k for the 6 million part-time developers per year, and you get another 
$210 billion. If you add this up, it gives you roughly $1 trillion spent in wages per year on software developers. So that doesn't account for everything else, right? From the computer to the rooms in which they work to uh, taxes paid on, on the salaries, et cetera, et cetera, right? Just salary. And, you know, those numbers might be high for some parts of the world, but they're also, uh, you know, the 65 and 35K, but they're also quite low for other parts of the world, right? Um, so it, a trillion dollar gives us a good sort of like, you know, guesstimate of roughly how much money is spent. So now let's sort of like compare it back to the $1 million that we're spending um, on funding open source. So if you take a hundred of those um, sort of like you know, bill, stack of, of $100 bills, you get a pallet, like a wooden pallet, and, and, you, and, and you stack on all those, and that gives you $100 million. Now get 10 of those and you have $1 billion, right? 10 pallets, $400 bills, $1 billion. But remember the wages we're talking about is not 1 billion, it's a trillion dollars. So let's have a look at what that means, right? Here you have $10 billion, right? So you have for size, a, a full a full size truck on the left. Let's have a look at what $1 trillion means. You need to stack a hundred of those to find $1 trillion, right? So $1 trillion, that skyscraper right there made of $100 bills on wooden pallets, on stack wooden pallets. For size, remember down there, we have a $1 million, right? So what can we say about this? Well, that there's a huge discrepancy between sort of the money that is spent on developers worldwide, right? And the money that is used to fund open source right now. And so that begs the question, is money really what's missing, right? Are we trying to solve the right problem here? And so one interesting way of looking at this is looking at the amount of developers um, that are actually fully employed by a company and that are not looking for actual funding, right? So the, you know, the, the Linux kernel is an interesting example because we have data for this from the Linux kernel development report. So in 2016, right, right uh, two years after the Heartblade bug, but that, was, that has been consistent before and was consistent um, after, Roughly 93%, uh, 92%, sorry, of developers working on the Linux kernel were employed. They were doing that as part of their job. So it's it's not like it's suddenly, you know, they will suddenly spend more time because they're paying for it. That they, you know, they get funded for it, right? It's more of a question of maybe do they have enough time to work on this? And, you know, before we sort of like dive deeper um, into um, if it's not money, then, then what is it? I think it's, it's worth spending a bit more time considering what would the, the outcome be um, if we really found a way to fund open source developers on one side. Um, and um, a really, for me, a, a really key um, quote uh, in, in that space is one by DHH, the creator of, of um, Ruby on Rails, who wrote um, in 2013 in an article called The Perils of Mixing Open Source and Money, the following thing. He said this, part of the reason much of open source is so good and often so superior to closed source commercial projects is the natural boundary of constraints. If you are not being paid or otherwise compensated directly for your work, you're less likely to needlessly embellish it. You're solving the problems for you and your mates, likely in the simplest way you could, so you can get back to whatever you originally intended to do before starting to shave the yak. 
So what is DHH talking about here? He's essentially saying that there are real benefits in having a culture of developers working on projects, on, on products, on software. And as part of that, taking a little bit of time to package sort of like well-scoped solutions as open source projects that they can open source rather than build a whole industry and a whole um, organization of people doing sort of open source as a business. So I think that's a really interesting aspect is to say that um, the frugality of having to build open source projects like this makes the projects really, really focused on solving specific problems and not sort of like um, development for the sake of, de of development. Again, as I said before, the other real risk for me of um, really hoping to fund open source strictly through um, essentially money, charity like donations, is the real risk of, be of building this sort of like separate culture where you have on, on one side open source developers funded by large corporations creating open source software um, that is then, you know, and, and, and these developers living not really well, like not really having ends meet, um, having to, to go from funding to funding, having to fight to sort of like hustle to sort of get enough funds to continue being able to work on a project, right? With the risk, all the risks that we've seen before, maintainer burnout, etc., projects getting closed, security issues not being resolved, uh, the projects not being patched, etc. Um, and on the other hand, you know, this sort of like corporate cast of, of, of developers um, with really nice salaries, but essentially writing glue code around um, open source software created um, elsewhere. Um, and, and that doesn't seem like a really beneficial, um, great environment to work in for actually neither of the players um, in, in the script. And I think this sort of brings us to a last question, which is what is the real value of open source? And isn't it time to sort of look beyond the value of just the source code and consider um, all of the other aspects of open source and all of the other benefits of um, uh, contributing to open source that you can have outside of just the source code itself. So, you know, the way that we've been sort of thinking about this open source sustainability problem is to think of open source as a pool of commons, like all of the software available to everyone built by open source developers that you sort of see around this pool here. And on the other hand, like across this sort of border in the middle, corporations relying on open source software to build stuff. And so we've realized that there's a real problem here because no one's paying for these open source developers and as a result, the software has problems. And so we're just throwing money at the problem, right? So funding open source essentially through cash um, with the hope that this will motivate all of these different actors in this um, mythical open source ecosystem to contribute to the pool of commons. And as a result, that corporations funding this open source projects and the, you know, and the other ones just benefiting from those funds will be able to sort of capture the perceived value of this um, pool of commons. This, in my opinion, really misses the big picture of what the true value of open source is. And if you've been part of an open source ecosystem, I mean, and, and to some degree, all of you being here today are part of, part of one, right? At different levels, obviously, but you've realized that a lot of the value in an open source ecosystem isn't just the code being funded, right? Um, it, it's in the, the code being worked on, sorry. It's actually all of the interactions, um, all of the learnings, all of the benefits of being in a community that is working together on solving um, really complex and, and difficult 
um, um, coding uh, problems. Um, and so the real value, and, and I've talked about that in, in, in other talks, but the real value is um, the, the benefit and the learning um, that as an individual participating in this community, you're getting, right? And so the real value, all of you are actually taking back with you um, home, but also to the companies that enable you to work in this, to participate in this ecosystem. Um, and, and so the real question um, then becomes um, not sort of how you can capture the value as a, as a corporation, right? The capture the value of the code, but how you should really refocus your attention to sort of understand how you can capture and how you can capture the value that is created by this whole set of interactions. And to better understand that, uh, to better understand how companies should get um, involved in open source, it's good to stop looking at corporations as just these like entities, but also consider that these entities are full of developers that are themselves quite capable of actually contributing to open source and in, in lots of cases do. Um, and so instead of really focusing on just these developers contributing to open source, uh, let's remember that the real value of open source is in all of these interactions, right? And so, you know, if you actually allow, as a company, your developers to participate in this ecosystem, right? All of those um, interactions are going to help your developers influence the project, um, uh, learn from others, um, et cetera, right? Um, and that as a result of these interactions, as a result of this community, uh, your developers participating in that ecosystem will actually bring all of the value that they've acquired back home. And that's how corporations truly benefit from open source. Not only, uh, not just by using the code that's uh, the, the output of this whole process, but really by getting their engineers involved in the process and leveling them up, improving, uh, um, allowing, allowing them to grow and, 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 and benefit from this ecosystem and becoming better engineers, understanding, adopting better practices, et cetera. And, you know, as a conclusion, I think it's really important to understand that charity like funding to open source alone is not going to be the solution, right? Of course, it's a great ad and it's wonderful if we can uh, allow a number of community members to live uh, open source differently and work on open source full time, uh, not necessarily working for a corporation, um, if that's what they want and if like the whole ecosystem benefits as a result, right? But the real way forward is to normalize engineers like you all contributing to open source as part of their day job. And to make that possible, the best solution is to make corporations and organizations really understand the return on investment of having their teams contribute to open source. Voila, that's it for today, people. Um, I would love to have questions about this um, and I'm happy to address them in um, the chat. Thank you so much for your time and your attention. Bye-bye.